Hello everyone, today we talk about the Duchy of Saxony, Arto Godum Sassen in Low German, Erzogtum Sachsen in, in German, lasting from 804 to 1296. Today we do not talk about Old Saxony nor about the Electorate of Saxony. I will make other videos about those. We talk properly about this um, this area, as we will see now that the Erzogtum here corresponds to a to an important political and, and ethnic concept. In fact, an area settled by the Saxons in the late uh, early Middle Ages, uh, where they were famously subdued by Charlemagne during the Saxon Wars from 772 to the in fact the beginning to 804, uh, and uh, thus incorporated into the Carolingian Empire. I made a video that is titled Voden is buried at Werden in which we talked about the, um, the, the Carolingian conquest of Saxony. I will make other videos about the continental Saxons um, and about the Frankish Saxon Wars that are one of the most um, momentous events as you know in the history of of medieval central Europe uh, and beyond. Upon the uh, 843 Treaty of Verden, Saxony found herself as one of the five German stem duchies of East Francia, of the kingdom, right, that had been formed in the, in fact, in the easternmost part uh, of the empire. Um, and the Duke of Saxony, Henry the Fowler was elected himself Eastern Frankish king in 919. His son will be the first German emperor crowned by the popes. Um, talking about probably German in that sense as Eastern Frankish. Um, and uh, as such, he would found, uh, even though it's a bit of an improper term at least to distinguish it from the one of, of Charlemagne and also the, the previous actual Holy Roman Empire, right? Uh, together with which we know mostly this, um, in fact, revived axis between Germany, Italy and other territories that at that point was ruled by the House of Saxon, which is quite fascinating, especially in the aforementioned perspective of the Saxons having been among the, the most hardly resistant peoples against the Carolingian Empire and eventually becoming properly Christian Roman emperors and set like this, this entity that will uh, remain uh, uh, such from a geographical point of view at least until the early 19th century. Um, I made lots of videos about the Ottonians so I thought that, given that there is a lot to, to tell, and properly about Saxon, uh, while the, the previous argument is uh, a bit more uh, international, as you understand, to leave a bit like the history of the Ottonian Empire out of the one of, of the Saxon duchy here. So, of course, I will refer to it uh, unavoidably, but it, it's not uh, this, the, the, the video deputed for it, and again, there is an entire playlist dedicated to the Ottonians, so if you're interested in the Empire uh, at their time, you can r really check that out. Today we will look, if anything, how they rose right, uh, to power and how the, the, the matter affected um, this, um, this region that instead, from the late Middle Ages, after a time of uh, a, a great peak, right, especially during the uh, reign of the Welfen, uh, the, especially the most famous representative, Henry the Lion, who died in 1180. Uh, the ducal title fell, first of all, to the House of Ascania. We talked about them, as, uh, especially in the, in the video about the Margraviate of Brandenburg. So their history is actually very, very intertwined, as much as the one of Thuringia, right? Into the, the Saxons had the fact of turn into a sort of um, client state uh, from from the times in which they had actually crushed 
it in the 7th century. I made, I made a video about medieval Thuringia and, and the Thuringi, actually, both. Um, um, during the migration era, right, together with the Franks, interestingly enough. So complex histories, but uh, that's why we make these videos in the first place. And the end of the development and the, the general trend f following the the disintegration of the German monarchy in the first place, right? Even just, you know, with the, uh, in spite of the fact that Welfen had been some of the major opponents to the Hohenstaufen at that point, uh, would bring the uh, Saxon territory to be split into numerous territories in a feudal dimension now. The, the Principality of Anhalt in 1218, the Welf Duchy of Brunswick Lüneburg in 1235, with the remaining lands being divided in 1296 between the Ascanian dukes of Saxe Lauenburg and Saxe Wittenberg, the latter famously obtaining the title of Elector of uh, Saxony, right, by the same Golden Bull 1356, which, as you know, um, the um, the German kingdom defined, right, as also basically the Holy Roman Empire, the, um, the, who were the official institutional electors, right, and Saxony w was one of them. So that's a very interesting part of, of the story. I refer to it, especially in the video about the, um, about the, I, I talk about the Wittelsbachs in general, the Luxembourgs. Um, so in, in there is a, a playlist known as Princely Germany, and we will talk about again the electorate of Saxony in another video. As far as the Middle Ages uh, are concerned, today we stop properly to the um, to the end, at least of the broader duchy, as such. So, looking a bit at the map, um, the Saxon stem duchy covered the greater part of present-day northern Germany, right? Uh, so, this essentially this stripe that runs from, say, the Netherlands to Czech Republic, roughly. In fact, it, it includes the modern German Lenda of Lower Saxony, Saxony-Anhalt, uh, up to the Elbe and Zale rivers in the east. Uh, the city-states that are virtually states on their own still, and they, they think to be as such within uh, the the German um, f Federation that are Bremen, Hamburg, we'll talk about them separately together with Lübeck because of the Anseatic League and so on, uh, as we will see the, the things uh, deeply uh, intertwine. Um, Saxony, the Dutch of Saxony included also the Westphalian part of North Rhine-Westphalia and the Holstein region that was essentially the north, the, the ancient North Albingia of Schleswig-Holstein. In the late 12th century, the famed Duke Henry the Lion also occupied some territories in the adjacent area of in, in the east of Mecklenburg that from Ottonian times had actually been part of Saxony as a sort of, of a of a mark, the the Billung one, right? So it's a bit like the Margravate of Brandenburg and other marks in, in the east. There, there is the one of Meissen, for example. Those are essentially Saxons. And they also because the, the previous lands were occupied by the Slavs, so this this is part of the Ost Zidlung. And Saxony was the, the protagonist in this northern area, right, of all this colonization, settlement, deforestation, old city building, uh, and so on. Um, and this also thanks to the fact that the Saxons were one of the most robust groups in the late tribal culture of the times. They were um, northerners. Um, they, they originated fundamentally from the same area of, of North Albinja historically, uh, they came south of a primitive, warlike, rude, tough. Basically, they they don't have in that sense much to do with with that, considering the previous, um, you know, uh, Germanic settlement uh, before the, the migration era. But in, in a sense, the land embodies culturally a bit that sense of roughness and and brutality and toughness and pride of the. 
um, Germans of the Battle of the Teutoburg Forest, right? German nationalism made of Saxony a bit this sort of uh, alternative, let's say, um, uh, to, uh, to to the Swabian Southern um, Imperial one, right? Searching for, for Romanity, right? For the Mediterranean dream, etc. By saying, look, this were the, 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 the true hardcore tough and rough uh, Germans who colonized uh, this this lands uh, in the north against nature, against other uh, ferocious peoples expanding in, in the Baltic, uh, etc. And so that that would have been the way to go, right? To to expand from within the same Germany in the adjacent kind of central uh, European space. So there is a bit of this mythology, uh, but it, it somehow sets the mood right for when you have to characterize uh, more or less um, uh, these people. Um, one characteristic of the Saxons, however, differently from basically all the stem duchies by the time of um, of Eastern Francia, the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, was the fact that historically had never had a monarch, right? Essentially, they were quite tribal. They had uh, sort of uh, more fragmented, even political um, profile. We'll see it now. Um, and um, as such, they also embody a bit that, that older tribal tradition rather than the more Frankish influence, clientarily nobiliar one of the South. And f- the reason being that simply the North was poorer, right? And so they had less surplus, the elites were weaker, and the people, in a sense, were kind of, um, at least in relative terms, stronger against uh, the, the rise of an aristocracy. And then that's what makes actually Saxon history interesting in the 10th century, because they, are, they actually create their own, say, if not their own empire as such, but they, they rise at least as the most powerful people in Germany, and they manage to basically elevate Saxony to the, that imperial dignity which um, comes from a bit, uh, what, what I spot in every civilizationally successful enterprise, essentially the, the blend of this, of the traditional and the modern, right? When, when the, the two, like, basically just radicalize into each other, they don't work, right? When you have the hybrid, you have the boom, you have um, this, this enlightened aristocracies that know how things work and, and know how to essentially uh, co-opt, involve, and motivate the, uh, the outcasts, right? You know, the, uh, the, the poorer um, people towards kind of uh, a shared goal, right? This is everywhere from the time of the Romans to, to Napoleon, etc. And the Ottonian Empire, in my opinion, does represent this as well, surely in its own particular way. Um, there are naturally when we talk about Saxony, we can refer also to the sense of the old Saxon, right? The homeland of the Saxons during the early Middle Ages, aside from the you know, just later uh developments. Alt Saxon, right? Um this um so the this space near stretching from near the mouth of the Elbe up to the river via the um Prussian province of Saxony. So in present day Saxony Anhalt to Upper Saxony, the Electorate, the Kingdom of Saxony, even in the in uh, from 1806, uh, corresponded with essentially the the Free State of Saxony, uh, and so something that was not really part um, of the medieval duchy. And this is important to stress because you know polities, territories, people really change over time in a way. Um, so, there are interesting implications also about the, the migration era, the fact that the Anglo-Saxons are technically, you know, uh, called like this, because people from these areas moved across the, the North Sea, and there was a lot of back and forth, and in fact, there is a, a legend uh, by the 10th century chronicler Vidokind of Corvey, one of, uh, as you know, one of the most important abbeys, in fact, in, in Germany, in Saxony, okay, in Saxony, the uh, Res Geste Saxonice, right, so, the, you know, the deeds of, of the Saxons, uh, there, these are three books in, in a, in a form, tell the, again, ancestral 
legion that the Saxons had basically had their own Hengist and Horsa in reverse moment, right? You know, as uh, the the Saxons had invaded, uh, the Anglo-Saxons had invaded post-Roman Britannia, basically, the the story here went that um, the in fact the, the 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 British Saxons at that point had basically come back in part called by the Merovingian rulers of Francia to support the conquest of the Thuringian kingdom, which may not even be so strange because obviously while the continental Saxons were fighting against the the Thuringians uh, allied with the Franks. Of course, there might have been some, uh, you know, leaders that had settled in, Sa- in in Britain temporarily and that decided, okay, you know what, like, there is an opportunity there back home which we have contacts and it's, you know, we, we can't seize those Thuringians' uh, land and let's move back there. So there is this sort of landing, according to Widukind, uh in the uh, Land Haden, Right, which is a historic landscape and former administrative district, by the way, northern Germany, with uh, its seat in Otterndorf on the lower Elbe, uh, in the so-called Elbe-Weser Triangle, which makes you understand, by the way, how close these peoples were to the Franks in the first place. Today I will not digress on that, but made multiple videos, say, in the relation between the Franks and the Saxons. You know that they are um the the their their uh, say that their customs at least were quite similar right their their language broadly meant the franks were western germans by that point they had also of course moved um uh, further west into romans lands and changed accordingly the the saxons came a bit more from from the north they were technically not say they were borderline elb germans so something between northern germans and elb germans um and um and and so the the story goes that these guys settled, say landed there to come back or to 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 fight against the the Thuringians. Now, where can we start the history uh, of of the duchy, uh, say from from old Saxony? Well, I think uh, the Royal Frankish Annals give us this um, this uh, help because they mention in seven hundred forty three. The Frankish campaign led by the Carolingian mayor of palace, Carloman, against the Saxons. Right. So, this was, you know, the context. Uh, the Carolingians were Austrasians. Again, they lived just next door to Saxony. Actually, they were the ones most aware of how much of a pain in the behind the Saxons were because historically they had always been raiding the Rhineland. Um, and there is actually uh, much of a, you know, at least motivated payback that, that the Franks had, you know, against the Saxons for this multi um, uh, secular tit for tat kind of, uh, of struggle. Um, the Franks were in the region, the civilization, the, the Saxons were still a tribal people, they had another um, way of life in many ways. Um, there was a second expedition in 744 led uh, again by Carloman, uh, was, did, as you know, the eldest son of Charles Martel, by the way, uh, together with his brother, Pepin the Short. Um, in 747, Carloman and Pepin's bro- uh, rebellious brother, Griffo, the Duke of Men, uh, allied himself with the same Saxons and uh, temporarily conquered the stem duchy of Bavaria that, at least again, we don't have, doesn't sound so grandiose as it is. Basically, this guy had just received a support in the, in the eastern frontier of the, uh, what is still even the, the Merovingian uh, Empire at this point, uh, and he had settled in Bavaria. He had basically nothing to do with Saxony, just receiving a support from the Saxons in, in the process, but it was to not much of an avail, right? This, this still was periphery. Um, Pepin, uh, Frankish king from 750, again invaded Saxony and subdued several Westphalian tribes until 758, right? Consider at this point the Saxons are, uh, as all the, say, migration era confederacies, mostly attached to their own tribal identity, single tribal identity, is to say that they wouldn't consider themselves much as Saxons, which is a random name literally coming from the Seax, right, just like the Franks, the Alemanni, they are very 
very generic international shout outs then this the, the Westphalians, the Angrians, the Westphalians, the North Albanians all had their own their own thing going on, right? They they were different uh, in nature, in temper, in culture, in, in environment, in etc. Now, in 772, Pepin's son, uh, Charlemagne, started the final conquest of the Saxon lands that, as you know, was one of the most singularly, uh, and traumatically, and radically brutal um, military enter as successful telling the truth, for good military enterprises um, in the high middle ages, basically through it, the Franks accomplished what not even the Romans had succeeded in, basically unit invading, colonizing, and consolidating the entirety of Germany. Um, this naturally had been uh, relentlessly happening from quite a while, right? The Merovingians had surely started the process in the first place. Uh, and uh, the, it, it's difficult, of course, to, to talk about the brutality of the whole thing. Uh, the, the first ones were started surely knowing that there was no short-term benefit to it, but at the end of the day, this consolidating this massive bulk freed the Rhineland from you know, the burden of being a frontier area and, and to prosper in the process. Uh, shifting the, the in fact the same border with 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 other peoples that such as the Slavs that had helped the Franks crushing the Saxons by the way, um, reaching the Baltic Sea, uh, reaching the Elbe River, and consolidating further uh, realities that were from from the other side, right, the sort of client states of, of the uh, of of the Franks, um, and the. Um, the the problem that again we will not digress on this part of the story because surely it's fascinating but uh, you have to see it from also the the, the practical Frankish perspective in the sense that uh, now having conquered this substantially large right it's a region it's a, I don't know how in English we can't feel it out like like a province of a region in something bigger like I don't know the entire Germany or but. You know, it's a substantially large land. It's uh, substantially populated. After all, it has. It's not, as we've seen, particularly developed as such. But it has a lot of moral resources, and all in all, it's, it's a substantial amount of land uh, with agricultural resources and all. The pr the problem being the aforementioned one. That is to say, the Saxons were not a, a single people, right? Uh, they were fragmented among again the the Westphalians, the Westphalians, the Angrians. Um, this was the time which the Norse were activating uh, or reactivating their own piracy. So North Albingia was also a, a that was the originary seat of the Saxons, a place. That um, you know would be contended between the the Franks, the Eastern Franks, and uh, and the Danes, um, and so the, these tribes were to be dealt with separately. That is to say, with separated peace agreements, provisions, whatever, and they mostly also quarreled with each other. So that, of course, there were lots of rebellions uh, in Saxony. Uh, that also prompted Charlemagne at some point to cross, uh, you know, the entire Europe to to to, to crash, right? To not to destabilize the entire system. So it was done just by hammering this already tough uh, and resilient people down to subjugation, right? They were successfully and permanently Christianized. They, in this sense, Saxony is one of the greatest successes of you know medieval civilization. I mean, they they basically got Thing so hard that that it was remained deeply ingrained in them like forever. Um, however, that the process was was brutal. Consider these lands had not known historically urbanization, centralization, nothing. So uh, the, everything had to be rebuilt from scratch. Right? The Franks would have the patience, the 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 method, and the the, the motivation. Uh, to to do that, the Saxons devastated, for example, the Frankish stronghold at Eresburg, um in uh, in Marsberg in the North Rhine Westphalen. Um, their leader Herzog Widukind refused to appear at the 777 Diet held at Paderborn 
uh, also in northern Rhine-Westphalen, um, and retreated to the far north of North Albinja, right? Also receiving support from from the Danes, from other peoples that were compact and that would also precociously adopt Christianity, uh, also as basically a mean of defense from the um, from the religiously exalted Franks and their expansionism. So these were areas that were, generally speaking, destined to be compact and a more stable political territorial rule. Just, uh, you know, the Saxons wouldn't back down immediately. So the process of resistance could be exploited by these leaders. And at some point, however, recognized their own, say, the, the failure at least of that political line. Um, Vidokin, in fact, led several uprisings uh, against uh, the the Franks that um, had, by the way, carried the uh, massacre of Verdun in the meanwhile, 782, which would, in which allegedly 4,500 Saxons would have been beheaded at the presence of Charlemagne, this is actually one of the most successful, um, you know, uh, let's say, new, fake news of the Carolingian historiography. Of course, it was not such a large-scale massacre, but the Carolingians had to uh, spread terror, right, and uh, to to prevent this. Um, there, were, there were surely, you know, some peoples, uh, some, some uh, chieftains massacred, um, at the bloody court, but um, not that kind of mass scale. Also, be, to what purpose? Actually, you know, those are much better used as slaves or as subjects still relocated somewhere else. Uh, many Saxons were deported, as you know, throughout these wars. Until uh, Vidokin allegedly had to pledge allegiance to the Franks in 785. He had himself baptized uh, at the presence of Charlemagne. Uh, and he became part of the Carolingian administration, right, as a Frankish count. Uh, Saxon uprisings continued up to 804, but again, from there on, there is nothing, right? Uh, the thing is settled as such. The wall uh, uh, Saxon stem duchy had been incorporated into the Carolingian Empire for good. And the, the the matter was settled, right? This this people was exhausted. They didn't have any other mean uh, to rebel. Again, the, it's a compact, uh, hard pressed uh, population between the the environment, the uh, that is somewhat cold, the land not particularly fertile. These people are framed rigidly within the you know the the space that. The, the, the harvest, the, the agricultural potential can, can provide, and the massive Carolingian hammering capacity. The Saxons are co-opted, their, their leaders provide with military retinues that are sent uh, to fight in various parts uh, of the empire. They, they do not quite understand why they would have to move anywhere more far than, than Germany uh, normally. So the Franks had a great care in irregimenting further these people, as we've seen with the Alliant recently, uh, the all the entire again, making them, teaching them Catholic tradition in a way that could be un- understandable by the level of, you know, tribal development with, to which they had understood it, like, uh, I don't know, Jesus being the hand of a uh, of a comitatus, the apostles, his followers, the, the the bloodier passages of the Bible, exciting their fantasies and so on, just as had been the case for the Franks back then, telling the truth. Um, so all this triggers uh, an important social engineering as well, because um, the the nobility fundamentally is further copped, developed, put at the head of, of a people that, as we've seen traditionally, hadn't quite. Um, of, uh, of that um, stratification previously, but this this again succeeds, right? After this, let's say Saxony was ruled by Carolingian officials, uh, some of the most obscure ones, telling the truth, because still it was a sort of peripheral area compared to, to the 
to the Carolingian heartland and other important um, uh, countries that had been conquered. Um, however, s consolidating the area was um, surely a, a very important concern for the local elites, right? And the same Carolingians that came to rule, uh, that were ruling on land in the first place. Uh, Vala of Corby, that was um, Charlemagne's cousin, because he was the son of Bernard, the son of Charles Martel, uh, and one of the greatest uh, trustees of, of the emperor, in fact, uh, ruled uh, on Saxony. He died in 836. Um, uh, he, uh, in 811, fixed the Treaty of Heiligen, signed uh, the, with the Danish King Hemming, right, that uh, on the base of the previous agreements uh, between the, the two peoples had set that the boundary of, of, uh, of the Carolingian Empire with Denmark at the Ida River, exactly the place which the Saxons had historically originated, but that was now peripheral to the same stem duchy and the finest border. Among the dukes installed by the Carolingians, naturally there were already Saxon ones. This was not so strange uh, in the empire. Um, for example, Vala was succeeded by Ecbert, that was the husband of uh, Saint Ida of Herzfeld, that was uh, likely the sister of the same uh, Vala. That's a close relative uh, to Charlemagne, and this is important because um, Ida herself may have been the ancestress of the Saxon Count Ludolf, that is to say, the founder of what would have become the essentially the Ottonian dynasty uh, as, a, as a count in the Duchy of Saxony. An ancestry that anyway would have not been boasted particularly in Ottonian times, um, which would have been actually useful for them because it seems they may have actually been um, descending from the same Vidukin um, uh, to actually being, you know, the, the thing being somewhat embarrassing considering the role um, he had had uh, during the Saxon Wars, but we're not sure about this genealogy either. Right, but what is mostly important is that from the Ludol thing spring the fact uh, the the Ottonians. Uh, Ludolf um, ha uh, married um, Alda of Billung, that was a um, you know a, a dynasty uh, of in fact Saxon noblemen from the ninth century ruling over a very large territory along the Lina River in East Falia, um, where Ludolf and the Bishop Alfred of Ildesheim founded the famous Abbey of Gandersheim, um, that recurs for, for, for many reasons, uh, including, you know, the, the Abbey's best-known canoness, Rosvita, that we will talk about on some other occasion. This um, this this um, abbey would become in uh, in the 13th century so important as to be properly the Kaiserlich Freies Weltliches Reichsstift Gandersheim. That is to say, properly the imperial free but secular foundation um, of Gandersheim. Um, Essentially, because uh, the unmarried daughters of the high nobility could live a uh, kind of spiritual life there, but without um, uh, taking up monastic vows, hence the, the title of secular. And this was a bit of a, uh, a boarding school for the uh, highest um, uh, German noble girls, which um, which is also fascinating. Well, the, the found it again. Saxony has an important territoriality, an important, uh, strat say, consolidation of also infrastructural um, locations, towns, castles, monasteries. Again, that uh, over time really consolidated a further net uh, 
providing the, the land with actually a, a great power and, and prestige. In any case, we are still in the some of the most obscure times between, in fact, the, the late Carolingian period, um, the decline of the empire, and the rise of Henry the Fowler. And until the, the, the mid 10th century, as you know, lots of bad stuff, including the Magyar raids, would in fact prompt the same Ottonians to rise uh, finally. Right? Um, uh, so we, we do not know whether the Ottonians descended either from the Carolingians or even Vidocaine. The latter is even more probable, but it, it's, uh, it's unknown. It really cannot be demonstrated uh, to this point. For the rest, they may have simply emerged, as you have seen from normal F Franco-Saxon cows, right, of the broader duchy. And so, of course, somebody had to emerge from there, um, even from some more humble rank. Um, so what, again, is, is striking is how functional Saxony was under Carolingian rule, considering it had been subdued um, and in, in an extremely violent way only a few decades earlier, right? Um, this, um, the role of, of the Ottonians in this sense is, is extraordinary. They would maintain the ducal title during the empire. They uh, essentially entrusted, given that they were often abroad, sometimes living properly south of the Alps, etc., um, to some other... Uh, rulers, the, especially the Margraves of the of of Billung, right? They would have this, in fact, uh, basically time of the on the road between the the mid time uh, tenth and twelfth um, century, right? Especially after the extinction uh, of the Ottonians. Um, Ludolf's uh, elder son Bruno, Brun, was the progenitor of the Brunswick cadet branch of, the, in fact, the Brunonen, the Brunonets, um, so ruling between the, the 10th and 11th century, mostly in East, uh, East Phalia and uh, Frisia, by the way, because there, there's not much of a site properly, the coastal dimension, like a divide between, the, that's how, what um, land that, uh, that uh, the Saxony reaches. Uh, if you look at the Ems River, perhaps it's a bit like the the most important um, natural boundary, but it's mostly flatlands, as you know, lowlands there, starting. Um, and also very, uh, very hard, uh, not very definitely remunerative areas that plus at this point are being raided by by the Vikings, so not really appealing um, at that point. I made a video about the Dutch of Holland, so if you're interested a bit in that story, it's not Frisia much, but part of it at least uh, as it expanded uh, it can be interesting um, the just for, for you know, the, the sake of record Bruno was killed in battle against the, the, the Vikings under, under the Danish uh, leader Gottfried in 880 because Saxony admittedly the Vikings wouldn't go so too much in land in Germany because they had better targets, but they were still pre pressuring the, the northern Saxon frontier hard, and the Slavs from the east were doing the same, plus all the other problems that existed in Germany, with, with, uh, among the various stem duchies, the nobility, the monarchy, and so on. Bruno uh, Ludolf, excuse me, was succeeded by his younger brother, Otto de Lastrus. Otto de Lastrus is essentially the father of Henry the Fabler, that was born uh, when the Carolingian Empire was still standing. So consider this in, in the perspective of just the Renovatio Imperi and eventually what the, the, the Ottonians achieved, right? How, you know, after all, the, the Carolingian, the chosen people, the sacred blood, it's a, it was already there, right? So they had all the kind of the, the, the tools to toy with this, this idea for, for themselves. Um, and the Ottonians added for good also the ethnic romanity of the empire, something that the, the, some of the Saxons, including Otto's biographer Bidukin, was not very happy about, because he said, we, you know, I thought we were the Franks, the, the, the Saxons, 
the thing is that for reasons that again I, I explained in the videos about the uh, uh, the the the, uh, the Ottonian Empire, the relation with the Byzantines and the Papas, etc., it, uh, is quite clear and somewhat unavoidable. But just to to maintain the point, this was a holy holy Roman Empire. And especially a Catholic empire, this is the single most important traditional concept since ever, since the millennia, even before Christ. The Catholic character essence, totalizing identity, value, and incarnation of the empire. Right, and these peoples understood that because even though they had been some remained some, somehow at the out, outskirts of that, they had understood pretty heavily what the power of that empire really was for them also to be capable of wielding it which is incredibly important um, the annals of the Ersfeld Abbey uh, that are dating to the time mention Otto de Lasters as Dux of Saxony um, he died considered 912 so the idea that um, the the Ottonians, the little things at this point were were feeling to be basically dukes, right? So a sort of kings of the Saxons, basically overlords of the entire Saxony is out there, right? Because otherwise the Franks would rule through counts, right? But the Saxons, as we've seen, were um, rude and crude, and so the concept that they would be more military leaders, and especially as this elected nobility, then say a count it's just like the guy that yes has a military power but mostly for the sake of the local administration would be the Carolingian rulers had not been recognizing this um, uh, this duchy as such so it's an interesting and the other Saxon noblemen by the way of course were not recognizing the little things much of this this power for their own for their own interest. In, in any case, the power of the little things, ex and at this point the, the Ottonians, expanded uh, dramatically. Right? Otto, in fact, um, was uh, you know strong and recognized uh, as such to wed uh, enough to wed Edviga of Babenberg. The Babenberg were, yes, the, the house that would eventually rule the, the Duchy of Ulster that has yet to to, to happen, right? It, it would take a couple of hundred years. I made a video about medieval Austria. But they were actually originally from, 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 from Franconia, from Bamberg, hence the, so the, the mixed name there. Um, and the, they were very powerful already at the time. Consider that... Um, the Duke uh, Henry of Franconia Edviga's father was the Princeps Militia of the King Charles III um, Charles the Fat um, and um, this tells you what kind of you know uh, role in the Empire it would have Franconia was called like that because it was in fact the most Frankish so the most imperial of all the Eastern Frankish uh, stamp duchies, so they were rich, by the way, because there are lots of there, there is the Rhine, there are lots of affluence, the mine, etc. These are the best connected um, uh, places in Germany, and entering, stepping into Franconia is, is a very important thing for the little things, Octonians, because uh, eventually their power in the 10th century would be based essentially on Saxony and Franconia. Saxony, the, the military brutality, and Franconia, the imperial grandeur, uh, which cavalled themselves beautifully uh, in this sense. Uh, and um, the, the thing was not of immediate recognition because Edviga's at, at brothers essentially were, were all killed. So as heirs of, of the, the Babenberg uh, fortune, um, in the feud with the rivaling Conradines that, however, were, you know, the killers. So, as we will see now, they would recur themselves because they would rise to great, great um, power in Franconia themselves uh, until the 11th century. So, what basically happened, however, is that Otto 
through his marriage with Edviga, managed to adopt, essentially to shelter, to welcome, to protect the very strong, um, say, say partisans of her father, uh, thus boosting for, uh, further the kind of the, his Saxon uh, duchy uh, politically, militarily, uh, internationally, uh, we can't say. Right? So at this point, power is consolidating in the hands of, of the dynasty. In 911, the Eastern Frankish Carolingian dynasty died biologically, uh, at least in male line, um, w together with Louis the Child, that died at 17 and was the true last of, of the, uh, at least in natural male line, the, the Carolingian uh, hair. Um, you know that mostly the, the actual center of power in, in the Eastern Frankish Kingdom had been the South, had been uh, Regensburg. Uh, the, the essentially Bavaria, that the mills arise from the the southeast, right? It was more important than Saxon. Now, think with the death of the Carolingians, now that things are basically starting to to change um, in, in another direction. Um, in fact, um, first of all, Saxony, Swabia, and Bavaria met at the Diet of Thorkheim. In, in the latter's uh, territory to elect the Conradine Duke Conrad I of Franconia, that would be with the, uh, the overlooked, I'd forgotten, uh, Conrad I, um, that, uh, as, as king of the Eastern Franks. One year later, Otto's son, Henry de Fabler, succeeded his father as Duke of Saxony. And the Conradine connection there, that, as you understand, you know, before the Ottonians had backed the enemies of the Conradines, at this point, King Conrad designates Henry de Fabler as his heir. This is said to us by uh, Bidu King of Corbey. Um, so this is this is heavy stuff because uh, first of all, in order to do so, Conrad was denying the succession of his own brother Heber, Heber the Third. Um, that uh, would actually uh, succeed um, his uh, his uh, brother, but the the concept uh, here is again that somebody is able to think and to theoretically, but also practically and and potentially carry out the consolidation of Saxony and Franconia. In 919, it's the same Henry the Fowler to be elected king of the eastern Franks, right, by the, in fact, by the a diet of the Saxon and Franconian princes at Fritzlar. This tells you how complex the, the politics, the fragmentation of the stem duchies internally really was. At this point, the, all, the Magyars are, again, plundering, you know, it's a very difficult situation, uh, again, the, there has been a shock because of the end of the Carolingian Empire. Everything is fragmented. It's one of the allegedly darkest hours of, of the Iron Century, as it would be uh, recalled. Um, and it is for this reason that the Germans start waking up a little bit as Henry uh, at least manages to to integrate the Swabian, Bavarian, and Lotharingian duchies into a sort of imperial federation uh, to put an end to most of the at least to, to try to 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 counter successfully most of the uh, Hungarian attacks right that were literally threatening to destabilize for good all the eastern duchies the one of Saxony the one of Thuringia that depended from the latter and Bavaria so the most interested elements um, and with significant swings, again, depending on the familiar mood and so on. I mean, the second invaders were entering post carolingian Europe only because the local nobility allowed that to avoid uh, centralization and things like that. So on the longer run, that was not really an intelligent strategy. And so the tide began to turn because everybody was really convinced of, of uh, instead of the worthiness of a more politically unitary uh, necessity at, at 
If anything, also because the imperial crown was at stake as well, right? At this point, there were no emperors, or at least no emperors that could actually control even a, a significant part of the empire. So, um, but the, the the concept of the imperium and the Catholic ecumenic power w was there for everybody involved, and uh, the, the the same Eastern Franks had been fighting for it uh, until the, the system. Uh, disgregated. Um, in any case, that's not the only enemy that the Saxons are coping with at this point. For example, um, the, uh, the 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 military expeditions of 928-29 um, succeeded to occupy large territories in the east, settled by the Polabian Slavs. Right, uh, the term applied collectively to a number of lectic. Lakitic tribes uh, scattered along the Elbe, and some of those that had actually been, you know, uh, supporting the Franks to, to conquer the Saxons. So now the Saxons were pushing the frontier themselves uh, further east, because uh, basically the Slavs did what the Saxons had been doing to the Franks, so con continuously uh, raiding, uh, creating problems, uh, destroying, also fighting against each other. Admittedly, Lubeck was refounded by the Saxons later on, because it was a previous settlement destroyed in the wars between the same Slavs. So, um, the sense the Ottonians uh, do not go easy on them, right? I will make videos about the the Elb frontier because it's one of the most overlooked in the first place in, in medieval warfare. Um, uh, Henry the Fowler's eastern campaigns to Brandenburg and Meissen the establishment of Saxon marches, as well as the surrender of the Duke Wenceslas of Bohemia, that had been, you know, just sponsoring part of these um, harassments, let's say, and generally speaking, destabilizing the Eastern Frankish Kingdom, marked the beginning of what is considered, in fact, the this German eastward expansion, the Ostsiedlung, that actually was, you know, going on from from quite a while. Uh, after the migration era, but that now was taking much more kind of um, permanent territorial, political, centralized uh, characters, right? So we know that the story, like how the thing went, as we saying before, we, we cannot digress on the entire Ottonian international history because it's just the sense it has also partially to do with Saxony. If, if, um, so Henry the Fowler's uh, death is in 936 at Memleben. His son Otto the first succeeds him. Uh, he is crowned according to Vidokin of Corbe at the Aachen Cathedral. So a hell of a reference to the uh, Christian Frankish Roman meaning of the empire. Uh, together, by the way, with the other Eastern Frankish rulers that had been supporting him, especially the, uh, the dukes uh, Gilbert of Lorraine, Eberhard of Franconia, Arnulf of Bavaria, and Erdmann of Swabia, uh, that received their, the, essentially their, their investiture by paying homage to Otto. Uh, Henry de Fowler had been building a hell of a large amount of castles, Right, this is a period of encastellation, and as all the great uh, German rulers of the Middle Ages, uh, uh, their fathers had been fortifying their domains, had expanded them, um, and profiled them in this kind of also military potential for their children to 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 go out there and get the thing done. Right? It's a bit like Alexander the Third with Philip the Second and uh, Macedon. Um, this is the case for literally. This is the the Ottonian Spring, the reconsolidation of the properly the Holy Roman Empire um, that would take the Ottonians out of Germany for a significant amount of time, out of Saxony specifically, out of significant amount of time. In fact, on the occasion, Otto appointed Hermann Billung as Princeps Militiae or Markgraf in the Billung Mark. Um, and uh, with initial orders to just subdue the Slavic um, 
uh, west, uh, say the, the, the Polabian tribe, basically, beyond the Elbe River. Uh, it's a constantly brutal frontier, which, uh, as we've seen also in the, uh, in the video about the marker RVA to Brandenburg, doesn't, like, before taking off, takes this hundreds of years, right? Um, so, incredibly complicated situations, Slavs were hyper-fragmented, there were there was an incredibly scarce surplus to consolidate anything there. It was mostly just Saxon steel, right? And a lot of blood running everywhere. And just for, for that matter, also the Slavs weren't kidding, right? They, they were a very tough nut to crack. They, they were fanatically uh, resistant. Uh, and the, the thing, in fact, would end up like uh, all wars do by if, if they you know, to, to destroy the, the contendants completely from, um, in the process by hybridizing them. So much so that, you know, the future of those lands is basically a Germano-Slavic hybrid in practice. They, are Ger they become culturally German, but, you know, uh, DNA doesn't, doesn't lie there. Um, in any case, um, in fact, in 961, Otto leaves for Italy. And Hermann, the Margrave, uh, becomes the administrator of Saxony in his stead, right? Um, so, uh, before uh, Hermann's uh, death, he was, in all in all, the, the de facto ruler of Saxony in the absence of the, of the king. This is particularly important, considered that... Uh, Aside from the from the Italian expeditions, uh, but that, that would take them literally out of that, that say ruling Germany entailed traveling constantly across all these areas. So, again, every place had to be still controlled by somebody else temporarily. Um, Hermann died in nine hundred seventy three in Quedlinburg. Uh, shortly after, the same Otto the first dies in Memleben. By the way, the same. Mo the same monastery of his uh, of his father, if I remember correctly, uh, Otto the second becomes emperor, and what he does, he makes Hermann's son Bernard the first Billung, the first Duke of Saxony of the Billung House. As you know, Otto also was quite involved elsewhere. Um, he died young. Um, admittedly, it was the the the, the, the minority of his son. Uh, uh, the future Otto the Third, plus with with a with a Byzantine uh, empress being there in the process, so that was a very delicate moment for Germany because, especially after the 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 destruction of the German army at Cotrone against the Saracens, the like the nobility that the 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 German one, the Italian one, began to rebel, uh, and this triggered some further kind of entrenchment of the nobility in their own prerogatives that as you know especially in Germany remains very very strong with a great difficulty for the monarchy to, to consolidate a sort of na in a towards a sort of national direction uh, considering in all this in fact 983 the year after the defeat of Cotrone uh, there was a Danish uprising in Hedeby and a Slavic one in North Falbinja Right, so this this northeastern frontier, uh, the Baltic one specifically, is quite um, it's quite turbulent. The Viking era is not over, by the way. There are also a lot of Slavs that take the sea, especially the Pomeranians. So um, Saxony is just there and has to cope with this mess. Um, Bernard the First Billung dies in ten eleven. Uh, at this, by this point, the Ottonian Empire is coming undone, as you know. Um, his son, Bernard II, becomes Duke. So from this point onwards, basically, uh, you know, after Arthur III was the, the Bavarian branch of the Ottonians with Henry II, but the fact that the, the Billung dynasty installs itself after the Ottonian one in Saxony. Hmm? And traditionally, there, there were enemies with the Bavarians. And they didn't like each other at all. Um, and they they self sabotaged uh, each other. In 1042, Ardulf Billung, is the son of the aforementioned Bernard II, marries Wulfhild of Norway, um, that is the half sister of the King Magnus of Denmark and Norway. Because, as you know, like the 
th those two countries mostly were just trying to take over one another monarchically. Um, uh, as a consequence, the Ottonians received Danish uh, uh, forces in their fight against the Slavic Vens. Um, uh, Denmark, generally speaking, starts going ever more um, towards the Baltic. Uh, the this uh, this point with the consolidation of uh, of England, the difficulties in maintaining, generally speaking, the context of such a large empire in the first place, um, and so the Danes naturally at this point are christening for good. So they would switch to essentially the, the, the Baltic Crusades as opposed to their Viking uh, activity. And they support uh, uh, the Saxons. Here we don't talk about the general fear that Danes had had also towards the Ottonians being, from being invaded, which was a possibility also in Carolingian times. So this had, together with a lot of influence in panoply, uh, material culture, etc., just compacted uh, the country first, uh, of all the, the Scandinavian ones and uh, brought to a faster Christianization to, to escape possible crusades, at least, you know, uh, conversion with some kind of uh, uh, with the invasion with conversion religious mission undertones, let's say, uh, in the process. Um, in 1059, Ordulf uh, succeeds his father Bernard the second as Duke of Saxony in 1072 it's Magnus Billung that um, you know takes his name as, as you understand from um, from his uh, half uncle basically uh, from from Denmark uh, he would die in uh, this is a very long reign for the times being more than 30 years in 1106. Uh, with which the Billung dynasty dies out because Magnus did not have, uh, say, uh, heirs legally uh, valid, let's say, for succession. Um, and as such, what happens is that the, at least the Billung territory as such, also as a dynasty, because th these were also private dynasties, were not just going off offices as Dukes of Saxony, but they had all a sort of specific land base, they become part of the Welf and Ascanian countries. Uh, these powers are particularly, um, particularly strong, so much so to trigger the, um, the fears of the, uh, the ruling dynasty at the time in Germany that were the Salians. So what happens is that um, the, the Franco this was the Franconian dynasty. It had actually connections, as we've seen, with, but they, they married all into each other, right? They were closely intertwined. It was a Saxon origin, even of those same uh, rulers, at least in part. Um, and th these rulers um, are, um, busy, are supported by, let's say, decide to, to support Lothar, of Saplenburg that had what was a Saxon um, nobleman that had uh, especially stuck to the to the monarch to, to to the king's party to to rise to rise in power. Uh, he became Duke of Saxony just after the death of um, Magnus Billung. So there is the the switch the dynastic switch there. Um, However, Lothar begins to um, to 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 oppose the um, the, the same salience, namely the Emperor Henry V, that he had previously uh, helped, you know, out of the crisis of his father Henry IV, and so on. Um, there is such a big tension uh, again. Now we don't can't digress on the uh, the details, but as you understand, there are always in Germany, like the pro-monarch, the anti-monarch parties, right? And they all act like this for their own specific interest, uh, feudally, royally, locally, whatever. Um, and the, 
as as a consequence there are there is uh, um an a, a, an intervention of Henry V in the same Saxony with uh, essentially the name namely the position of Lothar and the appointment of Otto of Wallenstedt in 1112. This triggers a Saxon civil war in the process, which is won by Lothar, because he manages to crush at Belfast Holtz the uh, forces of Henry V. This battle is uh, maybe not uh, particularly known, uh, popular, let's say, but it, it was one of the most momentous um, in the in the history of high medieval Germany, because first of all, ten years later, um, it allowed Lothar to be elected as Eastern Frankish king, and even being crowned emperor as Lothar II, which is quite a big deal. Uh, this was uh, done, by the way. Uh, at the expenses of the Swabians that were trying to recover. These were very hard times because the Empire had just lost the investiture controversy and this had brought to a, essentially a, a, a significant collapse of um, a very large part of what the, 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 mon the German monarchy had m managed to put together in the last uh, in the last generations, in terms of power concentration and so on. In fact, the rise of Lothar of Sapplenburg just three years after the conquered date of Worms can be seen as as, as this, because Saxony, during the buildings, had remained uh, a bit detached from the, the main centers of power. Again, the, the Franconians had risen in power. Also, southern Germany was compacting uh, more, as it was richer and more connected to the, properly to the uh, to the Roman expeditions through the Alps and so on. So um, Lothar's victory can be seen in this quite chaotic um, uh, moment, right, internally, as a bit of a Saxon uh, reemergence, revanchism, vindicated, right, and in, a, in an anti-monarchic sense. This is very important to stress. That is to say, uh, the, the investor struggle had naturally... Um, been damaging the monarchy as such and a, a country like Saxony had been r relatively decentralized from from the monarchic game at this point was from the side was going against uh, the, um, the the monarchic centralization albeit as we've seen the same Lothar had emerged because he had stuck together with Henry IV during his clash against uh, I mean Henry V after again all the problems that had been happening with his father uh, the excommunication and so on so everything was shrewdly done there is no immediate dichotomic mechanism here you can't simply outline but right Saxony felt a bit like that as well right the Saxons start appearing now after their moment of great grandeur uh, under the Ottonians to be now again the uh, the poor ones, right? The rebels, uh, the ones that are the anti-monarchs, and this is basically what starts happening down with the Welf, uh dynasty, because Lothar dies in 1137, and the Welf Henry the Henry the Proud, uh, Duke of Bavaria, already since 1126, is appointed. Um, as, that had been appointed as Lothar's successor, uh, Lothar died to without male hair, as Duke of Saxon. Right? There had not been an official investiture, telling you the truth, because everybody in Germany was always scared, again, about a single guy getting too powerful. So his claim as Duke of Saxony at that point was recognized by his rival. Um, uh, Henry loses uh, for this reason also in fact the uh, the, the German uh, throne uh, during the election 1138 and it's Conrad III of Hohenstaufen so the Swabians now that uh, receives the the German crown right um, but what has happened is tremendously momentous because Bavaria and Saxony join Right, the Welfen installed themselves 
because albeit Conrad III uh, stripped Henry uh, nominally of both the title of Duke of Bavaria and the one of Saxony, um, granting the, the latter to the Ascanian Albert the Bear, uh, quite of a name there, right? Um, due to his marriage to Lothar's only daughter, Gertrude of Supplingenburg, uh, Henry still holds substantial lands within the Duchy of Saxony. It can't be quite moved out. Right, Conrad the Third had, made, you know, he, he goes the Crusade. There are, um, he's the first um, Swabian uh, ruler uh, of of Germany, uh, but he doesn't have so much power um, as uh, his um, his nephew Frederick. Uh, and even in his case, as we will see, uh, the, the the clash against the Welfen will be. Um, quite hardly fought. Um, the Valfen had emerged, this were some f Frankish um, uh, dynasties that had been installed in Italy and that had just recently come back to Germany um, to escalate su successfully. As you know, the Valfen will, as we'll see now, the other major power in Germany, uh, summing the, the, the enormous amount of. Uh, of, of, of land and, and riches of Saxony and Bavaria together. Um, Henry, um, in order to control Saxony, had to fight with the, uh, the aforementioned Albert the Bear, that also has his substantial foothold, right? Um, Henry uh, the Thant uh, was also fighting for the same Bavaria, and he died actually while preparing an attack on the same southern uh, Dachi. Again, I would like to digress on the uh, complicacies, both politically and strategically, of all this. They're really fascinating, but we'll do it hopefully in another in another video. Um, what settled the matters, though, because uh, Albert uh, the Ascanian is not so so powerful at this point as the Welfen, um, uh, whose uh, power is. In constantly increasing. He renounces to the Duchy of Saxony, so the, the title that is consensually uh, attributed together with the one of Duke of Bavaria, with uh, to um, Henry X's uh, teenager son, Henry the Lion. Right, Henry the Lion being definitely the most famous um, Saxon, the Welfen, we'd say, uh, medieval uh, ruler. Uh, bringing uh, in fact the, the power of the northern land to an unprecedented might. Uh, in 1142 Conrad III granted the ducal title to Henry as Duke Henry III and this opens to the consolidation, the expansion, uh, the you know, the, the, the strengthening of the duchy, especially towards the northeast, that aforementioned space that by now had living the Viking era was over, Germany was rapidly um, uh, rising, now was starting to recover at least from the uh, the blow of the early um, of the early 12th century, uh, and especially the Baltic uh, provided with lots of interesting opportunities. As his uh, Saxon uh, predecessors, Henry the Lion, led crusades against the pagan Vens, uh, thus contributing to the process of Christianization of, of the Baltic. As we've seen, these lands were properly conquered and settled and uh, encastellated. So it was a great power of, a process of expansion of consolidation. What happened in Saxony um, is that the, here we are in the 12th century. Uh, there are few local resources, but Northern Europe grows faster. Um, and given that there are not enough resources locally, um, there are lots of people who are ready to move, to uh, be resettled. There are a lot of people, especially from Westphalia, that are brought uh, uh, to the east, right, cold, also across the 
the, the boundaries of, you know, the, the Welf and Dominions further east participating to the Ostasid. Look, this process allows uh, an effective also population replacement in the populated areas, the, you know, the availability of, of the substantial uh, and relatively cheap working force that manages to win new lands uh, from not just uh, political enemies, but from nature itself. This uh, Germany up to the 12th century was a, a quite primitive um, place, where covered in forests, swamps. The, the thing would take an enormous amount of work uh, in order to um, to fix, right? And remember that northern Germany here is the, the most uh, desperately strong right in in, in uh, pursuing that that objective the south is much more already kind of uh, absorbing french influences the chivalric models the, the proper feudalism there the, the Hohenstaufen, and the swabians will lead the way right the bavarians with the minnesanga the you know the the, the the development of the beautiful uh, middle high german literature uh, and so on the saxons are more silent but also more, um, let's say, in relative terms, more more active. Um, and during his reign, Henry the Lion massively supports the uh, development of the uh, of the towns, such as Brunswick, Lüneburg, uh, Lübeck. Right. Um, these uh, some of these are you know, properly continental areas. The Lüneburg was you know, the, the, the Bartengau, the areas from which even the aforementioned Billung dynasty had dealt. But it was initially settled by the Longobards, and that the, the Saxons had moved in, absorbing even part of the relics after the migrated south. Uh, here we have Lübeck, that is the, the center of uh, the most important of the, and the first of the Anseatic uh, cities that as we've seen, has been rebuilt over a previous uh, Slavic uh, settlement and will, will grow to, um, to, to great commercial prosperity, um, as you know. But this was a very, uh, say, we look at, at Henry the Lion, we say, wow, he founded that, it's great, but it, it was a very gradual, long, patient, hard process going on. Um, and re reactivating, helping to properly re-injecting lymph even in northern trade, etc., that uh, had never been so strong historically uh, up to this point. Um, the the importance of this expansion and consolidation in Saxony is that the House of Wealth will would be increasingly detached from its own lands in in southern Germany. As a matter of fact, um, the the Swabians will create the Duchy of Ulster exactly to, to separate it from uh, from the bigger Bavaria, right? Um, that was pretty large thing um, uh, in the time of the Carolingian districtuation, right? And that was gradually eroded at this point. So Saxony becomes a sort of um, uh, alternative uh, royal court, right? The one of Henry the Lion opposed to the um, the imperial designs of the House of Swabia. Uh, that was, however, supported um, uh, in order to essentially create an equilibrium, right? A two, say, distinct spheres of influence, one of, on the southwest and now on the northeast part of, of Germany. Naturally, it's much more complicated. We've seen it well with the in the video about the Margrave of Brandenburg, also the one about the the Margraves of, of Thuringia, that are all used by the Swabians to basically tackle uh, the Welfen expansion. Right. In any case, they had a lot to gain from one another because they they could stabilize the entire region in the first place, which was important for the respective territories also to bloom, to blossom at this point. In fact, in 1152, Henry the Lion supported his cousin, Frederick III of Swabia, so the one who become, as Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick I, uh, Barbarossa, um, in fact, to be elected King of Germany at that point, um, and being promised to regain the Duchy of Bavaria in exchange. Um, 
as you know, Frederick descended from his mother's side from the Belfin, so he was the, the, the most promising German ruler uh, in medieval times. Uh, and given his, again, um, Swabian background, the, the, the castles left also by his father, the homonymous Frederick, um, as a legacy, the proximity to Italy, everything would take, he would take another direction to one of the, again, of Lombardy, of, of Rome, uh, and so on. While Henry would remain, right, in this, uh, in this more uh, modest, but still powerful north, and uh, in fact, uh, displaying his, um, his uh, fastige, even at the court, behaving literally as a sort of um, uh, alter king, by 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 some degree, also because as we've seen, they were they were kins with uh, you know the the king uh, with with the Holy Roman Emperor. They were su of such of a, of a high noble birth. Uh, consider that Henry the Lion's dominion covered more than two thirds of Germany at that point, uh, at least name right from the Alps to the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. Um, he was truly one of the greatest rulers in Central Europe, and as such, a potential threat for other German princes, and even Frederick Barbarossa. To expand his rule, Henry continued to claim titles of lesser families, as, as they you know, extinguished themselves, for example, without a legitimate heir. Uh, Henry surely had a very unscrupulous and unprejudiced uh, policy, but it was also a bit like the one of, of the time in the first place. We've seen it being carried out by the same Frederick uh, the first uh, in other in other duke domes like the one of Lotharingia. I made a video specifically that it was within the same Swabia because technically these guys didn't rule again hegemonically over, over everything. Like no, there was a, there was a Saxon. It was properly uh, was said, especially for Swabia, honor of the Swabian dukedom it was represented by the local nobility that even when the, the duke was literally the Holy Roman Emperor could you know couldn't quite be overstepped um, the same goes for Saxony of course so everything was done in a moment which Germany is essentially transitioning from this sort of ancestral um, stamp duchies into a proper feudal uh, uh, Western feudal monarchy, right? This is uh, the, the the day, so many boundaries are being defined. Uh, the main problem uh, between uh, Frederick and Henry wasn't much this um, this competition, because at the end of the day, again, that they were very very neatly separated. Um, spheres of influence. Of course, much of their power overlap uh, was also shared and intersected. Uh, there is no doubt, there is no such, there's not such boundary in policy in the first place, but um, their rivalry has become a bit of a meme, as if Frederick Barbarossa just wanted to, to centralize everything, um, in spite of all uh, the, the you know, as if he hadn't regarded the, the local customs or whatever. What actually triggered the greatest clash between the two? We will see that there is a crescendo here. But the most important thing being actually the Saxon expansion into the Rhineland. And not even that per se, but the fact that Henry began to harass the, um, the bishops of the Rhineland. Which had, up to that point had always been supporting the monarchy. The national monarchy is such, um, and Wu's power could not be uh, just uh, trampled without uh, very strong complaints and a sort of blackmailing towards the emperor, essentially is taking away his support, um, their, their support from him if he had not intervened. That's what really prompted Frederick to, as we'll see now, invade Saxony um, and strip uh, 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 Henry, even initially at least, of his allodial possessions and ex exiling him in England, uh, etc. Because um, otherwise there were lots of other powers, including 
some other ecclesiastical ones that had undergone the same fate and that had not moved the emperor that much, right? Um, surely many Saxon noblemen weren't happy with such unprecedented power uh, of Henry that resembled the one of a king, nor the other German princes were particularly. Uh, Albert the Bear, that we mentioned before, was still there as an old enemy, in a clo- as a close one, um, uh, cooperating with, with the Swabians. During Barbarossa's fourth Italian campaign in 1166, a league of German noblemen declared war of, on Henry. This also shows another interesting dynamic of the German kingdom. That is to say, of course, most German noblemen, uh, most Germans in general, were, were completely uninterested uh, in in the Italian effort of the old the whole story of the empire and all this thing, because of course, if they had had the power to do that themselves, they would have embraced it immediately, and so also the Welf and Guiotto of Brunswick immediately went to Italy, just before promising the, the papacy that uh, that would have never happened. Um, but they were legitimately more concerned about their local issues, and so while the emperor is literally involved in one of the most important military expeditions in Lombardy, and so with, with all the implications of the case, the cost, etc., there was literally another war breaking out in Germany to try to put this guy down. And this, this tells you, of course, also how delicate and the situation of Frederick really was, because he wouldn't really be fighting on two fronts. That's what 19th century nationalistic historiography reproached him of. Ah, you should have just centralized uh, power in Germany, so we would have become a, a national monarchy like France and England, and instead it all failed because at the end of the day you failed uh, as emperors uh, going abroad, etc. Well, that's not really a, a good explanation at all for the, the reason we just said that every emperor did the, the same identical thing. <laughs> you know, just you know. um, but um, and they knew better, surely, what, what to do. But uh, this this war against Henry uh, highlights the fact that some that was a great discontent even towards Frederick's policy, or at least closing an eye in front of what turning a blind eye in front of what Henry was doing. This war was uh, engulfing the country for essentially four years. Right, uh, Frederick tried to mediate even. Um, and there was really not much that the, the rebels could do against Henry, who, in fact, was saved by his cousin's support uh, in, the, in the process. In all this, um, in 1168, Henry married Matilda Plantagenet, the daughter of Henry II of England, also one of the most powerful rulers of the time, in a video about him. Um, uh, her mother being Eleanor of Aquitaine, just made a video about Dutch of Aquitaine uh, recently. So the sister of Richard Lionheart, uh, uh, etc. The ties of Saxony, uh, the Rhineland, also more with um, with German, uh, with the with England, were quite strong for obvious geographical reasons. Most of the North Sea traffic, also the ones uh, intensifying the Baltic, were. Uh, unavoidably bringing the two countries to connect with one another. So the English normally sponsored Saxony against Swabia. Uh, that instead was normally allied with France, in fact, in the efforts. Um, and such marriage consolidated dramatically Henry's position, placing him even a step fur- further, his already grand uh, uh, say, European n- nobility uh, prestige. In 1169, the situation, in fact, deteriorated um, dramatically between uh, Frederick and Henry, because the latter ceased to support the imperial effort in Italy. This was a big deal. Right, it, it said that in the, the defeat of Legnano in 1176 was caused, among the other things, by the fact that the Saxons didn't send their own contingent. Right, it was a time which Frederick literally kneeled 
in front of, of Henry. Th these were men of, again, a radically extremistically violent sense of their own royal, nobiliar grandeur and prerogatives, right? For somebody to kneel in front of that, it was, it was feeling like what, what a slave would do, it was mean to be less, right? So for Barbarossa, the military help for um, crushing the Lombards was so big that he decided to grant what, what Henry was was probably awaiting as if you know, in a propagandistic sense, look at the emperor kneels in front of me. I mean, this is a huge. He was doing that, namely as a uh, as a brother, as a cousin, right? But it, it remained famous for the magnitude of the like of the begging that Frederick was was carrying out there. Um, and the most brutal thing about that is that Henry refused without blinking an eye. Um, so the the Germans and their uh, Italian allies were crushed by the Lombard League at the Battle of Legnano, Frederick barely escaping with his life, right, re-emerging out of days of, uh, you know, uh, disappearance, right, after the rout. Um, it was a, a colossal blow, like, notoriously, the Battle of Legnano basically changed the entire international axis as far as the Holy Land was concerned. It, it, of course, the Italian... Uh, theater uh, Germany's relation between f uh, France and England because from literally a day to another great part of Swabian power was brutally resized um, and you know Frederick found himself in a very difficult situation even his most faithful allies especially I don't know think about Montferrat sort of abandoned him so it, it was really a disaster to say the least the, the Lombards as you know, won the war, their prerogatives will be recognized at the Treaty of Constance, um, and they, they went on kind of prospering with Rome uh, towards their own um, city statehood. Um, this, was, again, it's, it's um, of course, uh, needless to say, the, the thing went to the favor of Henry, right? But uh, it wasn't say directly caused by that right Henry didn't of course was awaiting for such a thing but was not the direct responsible of what what really happened right uh, uh, was responsible for Legnano was you know those who fought at <laughs> Legnano from both sides and um, things could have gone uh, objectively different um, but the the meme again is is very often portrayed like that um, so many uh, Germans, by the way, came back to uh, to came back home from from their Italian involvement uh, after the defeat, uh, and this was used by Frederick now to turn them against Henry, right? That by refusing and you know again further cooperation at least was deemed, as we've seen, responsible partly for what had happened, um, was um, to find himself in a very delicate position. Again, most of the reason why Frederick intervened there was uh, pro forma for the, um, the, 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 the Henry's threatening of the Westphalian bishops. They were quite powerful and they, they enjoyed certain privileges. Again, the, the church stood with the monarchy, so there was no way Barbarossa could not intervene against this cousin. Um, and that there was, in this sense, a great princely support to the same emperor, as we've seen. There, there had been a war, literally, to kick out Henry, and it had not succeeded because Frederick had superseded fundamentally. Um, however, between 1175 and 1181, Henry was officially charged with several accusations including one of violating the honor imperi, that is to say, properly the honor of, of the empire, the, the wars, right, the breaching of uh, the Frida, um, treason, right, so the, uh, the, the greatest crimes um, against, properly, the emperor of the Romans. Because by following the summons to the Oftag, 
Henry would have acknowledged the, the charges as rightful, he refused all of them, by the way. And this tells you also what this man was you know, thinking really of himself. In 1181, he was thus stripped of all the, the titles. Um, he prepared himself for war. In fact, he decided to make the first move and attacking in 1180 the city of Goslar that uh, in in um, in lower saxony that uh, he had been coveting for several years already in part of his again uh, expansion consolidation Th- think about given the the ridiculous crop rate of the time how much it means to extend power on a town right Especially one that is richly thriving at that point and consolidating uh, yet another layer, another area, right? A- adding it to your own domain. Um, this war against Goslar, however, was um, straining substantially uh, Henry's vassals and, and, and other subjects to, to alienate their symp- uh, sympathy towards him, so much that the, the together with the uh, Swabian interference, Henry's rule quickly crumbled. He went in 1182 in exile in England at, his, at the court of his father-in-law, Henry uh, II, that truly was um, you know, at that point obliged to, to receive him, um, as he also didn't want to see the north of Germany being engulfed in further, further mess. Like actually, the history of the empire would quite quickly, you know, uh, escalate in a turmoilous, uh, turmoilous um, direction. Um, in any case, um, Mathilda died. The German affairs had been settled. The emperor participated in the Third Crusade. Uh, dying in it by the way so concluding at least his existence in a you know in a narrow romantic way at, um, from considering his heroism and the need to expiate for his uh, Lombard failures right in front of God and so on Barbarossa lived on in probably in the in the German mythology in the you know in the waiting for his coming back um, and so on. Um, as a consequence, Henry wasn't much. Uh, say he came back to Brunswick in the same 1189 when when Frederick died, um, and he on that occasion briefly tried to regain the lost lands. Right. However, his power has had been significantly crippled to the point. Of uh, rendering this enterprise impossible, into making peace instead with Frederick's son and heir, Henry the Sixth, Holy Roman Emperor. Um, the, the Saxony had undergone a, a severe impact because basically, um, uh, not just had been invaded, um, say, uh, of course, occupied partly, but you know, mostly dismembered. Right, the, the thing had. Uh, occurred with the essentially the alienation of every single possession of Henry the Lion that would have to, to equate to his uh, capital um, crime, right? Uh, even his personal allodia at some point were confiscated. This was something that impressed deeply the German princes because the allodium, especially in Germany, was considered untouchable, even by the emperor. The allodium, you know, is the technically is that part of... Um, of, of property that cannot be touched because it belongs just to the individuals as freemen, right? And so there, it's not just like a fee or whatever. It's an inalienable part of the of the local uh, of the guy's possessions, in as much as he's considered noble man as a freeman, right? And th- this aspect in Germany, as you know, that had a basically didn't have. Any public culture, if not a private one, right? At this, the, the emperors had tried to instill some sort of that sense of public culture, but the idea is that the prince rules because he is the guy, and that there is no such thing like, you know. Of course, we mean freemen as noblemen, but in fact, in Germany, people are uh, 
of the noblemen, right? As they live on their lands, there's no such thing like, I don't know, a, a town even that has, that is under imperial immediacy. That is to say, responds only to the emperor and just cannot have anyone above them that, you know, can step just one centimeters uh, outside of his district and not finding a, a prince or a bishop that says, not here, here I command, right? It's a, it's become now, especially in, in the second half of the 12th century, a, a brutally feudal land, right? Following that privatization system of cooptation. Uh, Henry, however, had been reintegrated of his allodium, right? So that was at least how much it had been uh, recognized to his, um, if anything, also to his blood. There was, the, as we've seen in part, the same one of the Orange Staffens. Um, as a consequence, th this is the end, basically, of the Duchy of Saxony as, as, as such, because the land was literally partitioned in some dozen territories that were linked to, to the German crown through the aforementioned imperial immediacy, right? That there were the f free cities, princes, whatever. That is to say that nobody could, that they didn't have to respond to anyone but the emperor, right? No other um, lord, right? And uh, this was uh, naturally a mutual relation of support towards the emperor, but of, also from the imperial side of support towards the these uh, apparently untouchable, just it had been in part the case for the, the Westphalian bishops. The western part of Saxony was split in several minor counties and bishoprics, right? Uh, it, that's how the Duchy of Westphalia was created. Um, it, it actually existed from the beginning of the 12th century, but at this point it was basically consolidated as it would go on. Uh, further until the 19th century. In the east, the Ascanians, that as we've seen were the, the Swabian supporters, finally gained um, a significantly a short, say, a smaller, though, Duchy of Saxony. Right? They occupied, by the way, only the easternmost part of that. Um, so the, the territories along the, the river, the river Elbe, around Lauenburg upon Elbe, and around Wittenberg upon Elbe, which is, by the way, the reason why the Free State of Saxony is called this way today, right? So as if the name had shifted from northwestern Germany to this much more inland um, uh, land, uh, in uh, essentially in a continental uh, context, uh, and that an area that had not been part of the Stem Duchy. Uh, ancestrally. Um, as you understand also the House of Wealth uh, declined, right? You have Otto the, the Fort of Brunswick that we also discussed, especially in the, that very delicate passage, you know, the, the Battle of Bouvines, namely, but also prior to that his struggle, I made a video about, you know, his rise to power, right? After Philip of Swabia was assassinated, not by him by the way, then his Italian expedition against the, the young uh, Frederick II was in Sicily. Um, then the Battle of Bouvines, his, his defeat, um, and his final death uh, in Germany. So that was a bit like the um, like the, the tail strike of the Welfen House, after which, um, in spite of the allodial possessions, would not remain um, in possession of, of the duchy that was in theft, as we've seen to the Ascanians, the old rivals. Um, the wealth possessions were, however, elevated to, uh, to the Duchy of Brunswick Lunenburg, right? So, also Brunswick and Lunenburg in 1235. Um, this is interesting because the Duchy continued to use the old Saxon coat of arms, that is, the Saxon steed, right? The Saxons were a bit obsessed with horses, even though. They didn't have such a florid cavalry like ours, but you know, it's the, the myth of Angus and, and Orsa, and the latter, probably the two horse heads that are uh, represented in, in fact in many places across uh, northern Europe, and especially Saxony. Uh, as the, the, the Saxons 
uh, buried as pagans uh, their warriors together with horses. I inserted a picture here towards the beginning as well. So th th there was the deep sense again of of tribal primitiveness that uh, lived in the, in the veins of these people. Naturally, now you know truly feudally and equestrianly vowed reality. But the the Saxon seat, right in Argent on Gaul, um, remains in the the Duchy of Brunswick Lunenburg while the Ascanians adopted the, um, uh, you know, the, for the younger the Duchy of Saxon, so it was called the most famous, like, when we associated with, with Saxon, the electorate uh, letter, the, uh, the, the Barry of Ten in Sable and Or, right, covered of Cancelan of Roms, Bentweis and Berg, uh, that were symbolizing the, the Duke Dome as such, so not much the the duchy as a as a district but the sense of personal rule of uh, and you see here the further feudalization in the sense that it's it's not about the the people or, or the territory anymore but it's that single dynastic ruler is very important um then the history of saxony proceeds with uh, and the, uh, the 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 saxon duchy has uh, with the House of Ascania. Uh, the problem was, as we've seen, controlling this relatively smaller space than before among the, the other rulers, um, uh, the, the Swabians and uh, their extinction uh, had succeeded in fragmenting not just Saxony further uh, uh, during the, the Great Interregnum, made a couple of videos about that, so in 1269, 72, and 82, uh, there were these two co-ruling brothers um, uh, of uh, as Dukes of Saxony, John I and Albert II, that began to kind of split more or less the, the governing competences within this territorial era. So as we've seen, um, and unconnected ones, right? This would remain, in fact, uh, until significantly late in time, areas like Adeln, Lauenburg, Wittenberg, um, and uh, essentially carrying out a partition of two main spheres uh, of influence. John resigned in 1282 in favor of his three minor sons, Henry the I, um, John the Second and Albert the um, Third, uh, that uh, you know would uh, basically remain the heirs in only three years, as uh, jo uh, John died in 1285. Uh, and given that they were minors, still their uncle Albert the Second continued. Uh, this joint rule in Saxony, also on their behalf. In 1288, Albert II decided to apply to King uh, uh, Rudolf of Habsburg, King of, uh, of the Romans, for the enfeoffment of his son and heir, Duke Rudolf the, uh, I, with the Palatinate of Saxony. This triggered a feud with the uh, House of Wetten, uh, by the way. Uh, Albert was naturally hoping to uh, receive uh, support from, from the Habsburg in, in the process. Um, when the county of Brenna reverted to the empire, because essentially the prior comital family had extinguished, Rudolf of Habsburg decided to unfail his homonymous from the house of Ascania uh, as, a, as a compensation for his father's support towards him. Albert himself was able, uh, only two years later, of gaining the, the county of Brennefer for himself, as well as five years later, the one of Gobmer. Um, uh, and King Benceslas II of Bohemia, that was, uh, by, by this point, as we will see, uh, there aren't yet formally uh, recognized uh, institutional electors, but in theory, every, every freeman is still an elector, but by the 13th century, they were virtually the same ones, the golden bowl uh, that counted um, 
namely Bohemia was one and, and, and Saxony also one. And just think about the prestige, right, of this line that had been fundamentally dismembered but still maintained the 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 prestige of the, because it, the stem duchies were I mean culturally speaking the, 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 the fact that there was a substratum that still was objectively like a, a sort of region in itself in spite of the feudal repartition remained and this was also very convenient to play with the with that electorate because uh, it was like more permeable more say softer where different games could be going on to win it or not I mean it wasn't necessarily an easier thing to do but it was just like uh, less of a contended you know out of the game at least uh, as uh, there wouldn't be Saxon kings uh, fundamentally um, and uh, the the Venceslas the second as we were saying uh, succeeded uh, Albert II to be brought in the graces of the opponent of the Habsburgs, um, so playing in the opposite side, the one that uh, the Ascanians had uh, sought uh, recognition from, Adolf of Nassau. Um, and uh, again, this uh, bohemian uh, medium was successful because Albert II signed um, a pact on November the 29th, 1290. One uh, that as an elector, together with another elector, he would vote, in fact, the same as the Bohemian king. Um, yeah, and uh, that's how, you know, on April the 27th, 1292, Albert II, with his nephews, that again were still minors, um, uh, succeeded in uh, actually in electing uh, the uh, Adolf of Nassau. Right as king of Germany, king of the uh, of the Romans. Uh, that was naturally the the profitable move because whoever would have been elected eventually would have rewarded uh, the uh, the supporters. Uh, we find the name properly of Albert with his nephews as fellow uh, Saxon uh, dukes uh, as back as twelve ninety five. Dynastically, however, this is, as we've seen also for other regions, the 14th century the, brings to the, the regional disintegration of many, many realities. The uh, Duchy of Saxon remains partitioned uh, one, um, one year later, basically, into Saxon Lauenburg, uh, jointly ruled by the brothers Albert III, Eric I, and John II that inherited thus their part from, from their father John I, in the Saxe of Wittenberg, um, ruled by Albert II, um, took over, uh, in fact, at the end of the year. The Thierland, the Zadelband, that is to say the, the land of Lauenburg, uh, the land of Ratzeburg, the one of Darzing, uh, that is today's Amt Neuhaus, and, and the land of Adel are mentioned as the separate territories of the aforementioned brothers. Uh, so that's how they shared uh, their father's inheritance. Albert instead receives uh, the Saxe Wittenberg, uh, centering it uh, around the eponymous city and uh, Belzig, right? Wittenberg, especially in the late Middle Ages, as you know, would rise to an important prestige under the local house with the university with you know the dual connection with the reformation and so on so the 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 Ascanian line of the Saxe Wittenberg is founded at this point with Albert the second um, these are by the way the ancestors of the future Hanover house so the not just the local prince electors, but kings of Great Britain in the 18th century, of the United Kingdom later, uh, and of the Hanover, uh, uh, again, uh, in 1814. What is important to remember in all of this, and today we couldn't, of course, look at them in detail, is that um, while there were some territories that were detached uh, literally uh, by the Swabians 
that through the formula of imperial immediacy from the Duchy of Saxony, there were others that were um, simply feudally bound to the duchy itself. So aside from the two duchies that we uh, say Wittenberg and Lauenburg that we remember, we, we have these other entities that remained fundamentally on their own. There is the Duchy of Westphalia, for example, the counties of Bentheim and the Mark, the Prince Bishoprics of Münster and Osnabrück. These were, you know, also relevant, like later times, uh, very, quite powerful. The counties of Ravensburg and Tecklenburg. Um, these uh, were in, in Westphalia overall as a region. In Hungary, instead, it was the, the central central one because again it was they were still recognized in their ancestral boundaries you have uh, the prince Archbishop, uh, archbishopric of Bremen that is it, still a city-state independent from from Germany as, as they think it at least um, and uh, very important um, Lee, uh, this this was in fact one of the major four major cities of the Hanseatic League um, as well uh, so they were really involved in different spaces. There was the Abbacy of Corbeil, that was quite important in the very south of Angria, uh, close to Thuringia, the county of Delmenhorst, uh, the counties of Diepholz, Heverstein, Hoya. The Lordship of Lippe, uh, this had been one of the Allodia of uh, Henry, uh, of, of the Duchy of Saxony, at least. Uh, so that it was one of the few that was not reverted, and so gaining uh, essentially starting a, generating a controversy. The Prince Bishopric of Minden, the County of Oldenburg, uh, the Prince Bishoprics of Paderborn and Verden, the County of Waldeck. As far as Eastphalia was concerned, you had the Counties of Blankenburg. This was a Saxon fief um, in 1180. And one of the Prince Bishopric of Alberstadt uh, after that. The County of Brunswick, later uh, the Duchy of Brunswick Lüneburg in 1235. Uh, so, as a loyal possession as well, that had uh, remained uh, in, the, in, the, in, in the Duchy. The Embassy of Gandersheim, that was, as we've seen, a free secular uh, foundation. The Prince Bishoprics of Alberstadt and Hildesheim. The County of Hohenstein, uh, seated in the eponymous uh, place, uh, the district of Nordhausen, uh, that today lays actually in Thuringia, by the way. Uh, the Prince Archbishopric of Magdeburg, uh, this is you know, Magdeburg is also the uh, place of burial in the cathedral of uh, Otto the uh, First, with the beautiful statue of Saint Maurice. That is one of, the, as you know, one of the first uh, representations of plate armor in in the West. Right, it was mostly on the sound in Eastern Germany on the Saxon frontier. is one of the most famous iconographic sources of the Moor with this uh, very updated uh, armor. Uh, the county of Mansfeld, the abbacy of Quedlinburg, a very powerful landlord, the county of uh, Wernigerode, the abbey of St. Ludger, and the one of Werden. As far as the north, uh, in North Albinja, you have the county of Holstein. I have to make a bit of a history of that region because it's, uh, it's fascinating. And mostly the prince bishoprics, the one of Lübeck, uh, the one of Ratzeburg and of the one of Schwerin, right? So notice that when we talk about Prince Bishoprics, we're talking about literally the church, right? So not necessarily just you know the communes that were in the city, in, in, uh, like in, I don't know, in the case of Lübeck, for example, water. So the, the thing is, especially if they were f free cities of the empire. Right, you would have a recognition that went beyond that kind of uh, interference. It's a bit like in Cologne that the you know the principality of Cologne was most powerful. It remained a prince elector, 
uh, etc. But the, uh, the the citizens of Cologne had kicked out the archbishop. Like just outside the city walls, it was the archbishop's land, but they had at least gained that internal matter on, on their own. Right? This is Germany. This is the the act. The, the it's very mm, say maybe in some of these things it's not really just typical. Um, or unique at least let's say but the, the the dynamics that we highlighted here just for Saxony are very uh, very fascinatingly eloquent for the for what probably medieval Germany was was turning to be the electorate of Saxony again would have its own its own interesting story but we do not talk about this uh, for today uh, I stop it here I just hope that you enjoy it this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content as always I thank you heartily for listening to me I wish you a nice time and see you next time